Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this UCL East lunch hour lecture. We're pleased to have you all with us today. I'm Paola Lettieri, Professor of Chemical Engineering at UCL and Director of UCL East, our new campus that is being built at the Queen Elizabeth Olympic Park and will be opening next year. Today's lecture is really exciting. It will explore questions of urban designs in the context of skateboarding. In a moment, we'll introduce three speakers who join us today to talk to us about the City Mill Skate Project, a community-based research project funded by the Public Art Program for UCList. It aims to co-create with local artists and skaters designs for permanent skateable architecture. And this is something that we are considering to embed in the new UCList campus on the Queen Elizabeth Olympic Park. How exciting. So I would like to introduce our three speakers now, starting from Professor Ian Borden. Ian is a professor of architecture and urban culture at the Bartlett, and also the vice dean for education uh, at the Bartlett. He has been a precursor of exploring skateboarding as an academic discipline, and is the author of Skateboarding and the City, a complete history published by Bloomsbury in 2019. And Ian has been involved in numerous skate park projects in the UK and worldwide. We then have Esther Sayers. She's a senior lecturer in education at Goldsmith, and she's heading the MA in Arts and Learning program. Her arts-based practice research includes a cultural participation, which in this particular case is pursued through culture in the cultural context of the skate park. And then finally, we've got Sam Griffin, who is an artist, a writer, and a researcher, and a UCL alumnus. And Sam has also participated in numerous skate-related projects, including contributions to publications, lecture programs, and designs of skateable architecture. All three of them can skateboard, of course, and Esther will be showcasing a whole wall of uh, uh, skateboards, and Sam obviously is in the very place at the moment. So before I hand over to, the, to, to this um, fantastic trio to tell us more about this exciting program, let me remind you that you can post your questions on Slido, and the code for today is LHL2. We will answer your questions after the talk. So thank you. And Ian, Ian is over to you now. Thanks, Paola. Um, thanks for the very kind introduction. Um, and thanks for the invitation to come and talk at, at, at UCL um, this lunchtime. We're delighted to do it. Uh, my role is very simple. Um, I'm a bit of a warm up act, really. Uh, I'm just going to explain something very, very briefly about the history of skateboarding and the kind of dynamics that are occurring within it. And then I'm going to pass over to Sam and Esther, who are going to uh, do most of the talking and explain uh, and explore the City Mill Skate project. So let me just kick off by, let me share my screen. Just a few slides really about, a few images about skateboarding. So the most obvious thing I think that people think about skateboarding is what we see here. They see it as a transgressive act, um, skater on the left, uh, using an old swimming pool, taking over swimming pool as a skateboardable architecture. They see it as street-based activity, and particularly from the 1990s onwards, skateboarding has taken place in city streets. And they also see it, image on the right, um, transgressive, but also dangerous, risky, very, very masculine in some ways. And then for many people, this is the sort of traditional image of skateboarding, which emerged from, well, from the start of skateboarding in the 60s, but particularly in the 1990s with street skateboarding. But more recently, um, we've seen some really powerful other dynamics in skateboarding emerge. So on the left, we've started to see skateboarders building their own uh, terrains. This is a small DIY, do-it-yourself skate park in South London. We've seen all kinds of creativity, uh, filmmaking, graphics, writing, uh, poetry, every kind of creativity you could imagine associated with skateboarding. And perhaps most importantly, you, you see on the right, 
we've seen skaters themselves becoming much more diverse. So we're no longer talking about just teenage or, or around teenage males. It's females, um, gender fluid, um, uh, people of all ages, all backgrounds, all ethnicities, and all over the world practicing skateboarding. And we're also seeing, because skateboarding will be in the Olympics in Tokyo, presuming that goes ahead for the first time this year, a kind of sportification. So just as the common grassroots of skateboarding expands, so also it's becoming in another arena, increasingly kind of professionalized and commercialized. So the big question is how do these three things come together? How can it be kind of transgressive and risk-taking, creative with new terrains, and also acknowledging that there's also a kind of sporty dimension to it. So just a few examples of how this is being addressed. Well, the most obvious one is skate parks, uh, purpose-built arenas for skateboarding. And this is a skate park in Southeast London, Crystal Palace that I've been heavily involved in. And very typically it's a large concrete permanent installation cost around 400,000 pounds and has a very diverse set of riders there. And these are pretty common now across the UK. Sometimes it's about taking over existing terrains. Again, another London example, the Undercroft at the uh, South Bank on the South Bank of the Thames in London, not designed for skateboarding, but taken over, um, colonized, if you like, by skateboarders. Um, this is uh, another kind of thing that is going on, Esther, who we'll hear from in a moment, is heavily involved in this project for Hackney Bumps. It is, was, is an old skate park first built in the 1980s in Hackney in North London, but is now is a community based project um, where the community themselves have, have transformed really a very run down facility. They've put their own money and labor and effort and community relations into this. And not only does this scheme attract diverse riders, but it also helps negotiate and bring together very um, different kind of uh, social and class backgrounds in quite a dynamic and rich part of Hackney. We've also had events. So this is an event which UCL hosted um, in uh, uh, partnership with the Smithsonian a couple of years ago. It was called Innerskate, where we took over the space in front of the Here East area of the Queen Elizabeth Olympic Park uh, just for one day. We had some ramps designed and made by some of our students. And in particular, we invited adaptive riders, um, riders who are blind, riders who are deaf, uh, riders who are on wheelchairs, to come and use these uh, facilities, use these ramps for the day. And indeed the adaptive side of skateboarding is another area where it's really taking off at the moment. So it's not just the able-bodied, it's people of all different kind of uh, bodies and capabilities that are enjoying this. And actually the guy you see middle of the top is a blind skater called Dan Mancina. And I reckon he's probably a better skater than, than me, Sam or, or, or Esther. Um, maybe not, but he's a he's a wonderful skateboarder and he's he's almost entirely blind. Uh, two more slides. Um, one other thing that's happening is that people are now turning to think about how do you bring all this not just into purpose built skate parks? How do you bring it into the body fabric of the city? How do we make our public spaces inclusive and welcoming to everyone? And what's happening is we're beginning to see, just beginning to see how skateboarding is being used as part of that equation. So this is a, a water square in Rotterdam. It's a multi-purpose place. You can go and have your lunch there, hang out there. Um, it floods with water at certain times of the year, but it's also been deliberately designed to be used by skaters at certain times of the day, week uh, of the year. And this helps activate the site and bring in different people onto the site. And that brings me to City Mill Skate, because what Esther and Sam are doing with City Mill Skate, working with UCL, is exploring different ways in which we might be able to bring skateboarding and activate different spaces on the Queen Elizabeth Olympic Park site. And we're hoping also at the UCL, including the UCL East 
um, site as well. And I'm now going to pass to Esther and Sam, who are going to explain more about this. So that's it from me. I'll come back again for the questions at the end, but I'll, I'll pass to Sam and uh, Esther now and I'll stop sharing my screen. Fantastic. Thanks very much, Ian, for giving us a broad overview to lock in the work that we've been doing as part of City Millscape. What we thought we'd do is start by showing a couple of short trailers from our recently produced film called City Mill Skate Dots and Lockdown. Um, this is a nine minute film, so it's too long to play in this arena. But the film tries to pay attention to coronavirus related restrictions that happened from March 2020 and the massive effect that that had on social distancing, skate park closures and other measures that affected people. Um, so in the film we're talking to people in London skateboard community and looking at how they impact on, on the City Mill Skate Project and the work that we're trying to do there. So the trailers will hopefully give you a flavour of how we think that the skate dots, skate dots that we are proposing build on the experience of skateboarding kind of on the street in the wild. And you're gonna hear from some of our research participants talking about the process of design. You can see the full film at Grey Skate Magazine online, but we'll also email you the links after the talk. I'm looking for stuff that I can skate because there's a lot of places that I can't skate. <laughs> I was learning to do slappy grinds, the smiley slappy. There might be loads of ways to collaborate with other people, make amalgamations of all of our ideas in some way, to have all of us have a little piece of ourselves in the skate park, I think. The street is designed for just about everybody else apart from skateboarders. One of the great things about street skateboarding is that when you go and take skateboarding to the street, something interesting happens because the skateboarding has to change because the street can't change. The idea of the skate dot was about trying to kind of recapture some of that spirit. With this, you're enabling people to actually publicly and widely use it. So whether that's the public just walking across it or like going past it, seeing skaters, but also being able to use it themselves. We want to make grounded recommendations about the use of the public realm. And that's because this project is about more than just design. It's about discourses around youth cultures, around health, around well-being. As a community, we should be really like helping people explore and be creative with the land around because it's a bit of ours as well, it's a bit of everyone, so everyone should be able to use it in their own way. Hopefully that mentality will just bring people a bit more together as well. As people who are from East London, who grew up in East London, who kind of saw the Olympics changing the shape of it, it's quite important for our voice to come through. So, um, as Esther has uh, just, just introduced on our little film there, there's kind of a little introduction about kind of what we were doing in our project and uh, some of the, the kits that we sent to people. Um, but the creation of our kits and us sending them out to people wasn't always part of our plan um, because neither was COVID and neither was lockdown. Um, our project had actually been in progress for well over a year before the lockdown restrictions came in last year. Um, and the timing of lockdown last year was um, priceless, really, in as much as we were quite literally poised to launch our entire project. We had painstakingly constructed a programme of events and workshops um, with young people in various locations and skateboard lessons and lots of fun and exciting things to do. Um, and the very week we were due to launch our project, um, the lockdown restrictions were brought in. Um, we had literally just had a meeting with the Bartlett team at the UCL East site 
about potentially doing some model making workshops with young people using the BART facilities there. Um, and in that meeting, we've been discussing about this very far off possibility that maybe the Bartlett might be closed until September of that year. Um, and then of course, that we know that rest is history. Um, and so we had to, we had a, a crisis moment really in our project where we had to think very, very quickly about what we were gonna do and try and predict how the world was going to change, um, how people's um, ability to live their life as normal was going to change. We already knew that we kind of wanted to invert a lot of the traditional processes by which pieces of skatable architecture get made. We knew that we wanted to place the skaters themselves at the kind of heart of the creative process, but uh, we also knew that we were entering a moment of great uncertainty. Um, and so we had to sit outside of the Here East campus in East London with our crystal ball and look into the future and try and figure out a way that we could still connect with people. Um, to create something that would allow us to connect with people in a situation where they might not be able to skate as usual, they might be able to go outside as usual, how, you know, how would their mental health be affected by the social distancing measures that were brought in, um, and crucially how we wanted to connect with people in a way that wasn't purely digital, how we could actually put things into their hands, that they could physically experiment, kind of play with and test their ideas out, because skateboarding itself is, is hugely reliant on processes of visualization, practical experimentation, failure, lots and lots of failure, um, and then reappraisal and then recreation. So we wanted whatever we were going to do um, to capture this kind of process. And so we came up with the idea of creating um, some model making kits. Um, we have a little animation here, which shows you everything that went into one of our kits. Um, we selected uh, our materials very carefully to kind of allow people to recreate things they might have seen in the street, uh, but to give them a selection of materials which would allow them to be very creative and to kind of break outside of the uh, the normal parameters of what you might think um, about skate park design or things that the way that skate parks are, are built. Um, and with the idea of the kit, we wanted to be able to kind of as recreate as closely as possible um, the spirit of the original collective um, group making workshops that we had as part of our original plan. Um, we also wanted to create something which would excite people, actually give them something that would really just genuinely make them happy. So the skate kit that we created here was envisaged, envisaged as a kind of hybrid of a, a model making kit and a kind of care package that you might receive. So hence, you know, we made some nice City Mill State skate stickers and the packages came with City Mill Skate branded tape. Um, and certainly, you know, we conducted follow up interviews with the recipients of these kits and it was like Christmas had come early for a lot of people. They were genuinely thrilled to receive these kits in the moment in their lives, which was unprecedented, very difficult um, for some of them, maybe a little bit unhappy as well. Um, and so, you know, that's that validated our kind of decision at this kind of emergency moment to, to go with this kind of idea to kind of reconnect with people. Um, we actually had twice as many applications for the number of kits that we created, um, which meant Esther and I had a, a couple of very, very busy months putting filling boxes with miniature trees and bits of cardboard and hand delivering some of them. But, um, you know, it was, it proved to be a very effective way for us to still maintain meaningful contact with people and for people to actually um, get into a position where they could really still express their ideas. Yeah. This idea of engaging with a community wasn't as straightforward as it might seem in a, in a way, because to engage with a community, you've got to construct a community. You've got to generate that community around an idea. The idea of co-design and participatory approaches to coming up with the ideas for skatable architecture um, around the Olympic Park was something that we were committed to from the start. But in order to do that, we needed to put out an open call. Um, and we started that on Eventbrite, where we um, just kind of advertised it as widely as we could to get as many people as possible interested in a what we were doing, and also to get people to sign up so that we could send them a kit and they could make some things and come back with their own designs. Um, it was very popular um, and successful, and we ended up with a lot more 
people wanting kits than we had to give away. We only had 48 um, of them made up in the first round. So we had to generate some selection criteria so that we could do our best to reach a good cross section of the skate community. Um, and so we selected according to age, according to location, according to gender, according to disability. We kind of looked across the number of people that had signed up and tried to select a range. Um, but the second image, you can see me handing over a kit on one rainy day in midwinter. This was this is to do with our second round of kits because following the open call, we'd received some fantastic designs back. But we thought if we made another 30 kits, we could reach an even broader um, and more representative cross section of the skate community. Um, so we created a second set and this time we selected specific individuals and invited them to create skate dots. Uh, and below we have got some testimonial from, the, from some of those skate dot makers. Just before we play it, I just want to kind of frame that with the fact that the research that we're doing takes place around the making. And this is really important to us. We need to and want to hear from the skate dot makers about their experiences of making from the kits that we provided, but also of lockdown and what happened to their skateboarding in lockdown. So all the interviews and questionnaires that we put out to, to, our, to our research group are providing with us with this kind of vital feedback. Um, and this is a bit of it, just to give you a flavor. Wait, but I can do it like this and then add a ramp on each side. Yeah, yeah, that's great. You've got to think about the aesthetics, Delano, you know, like you're you're sculpting a, a piece of landscape architecture. You stress me out, man. It's bending a lot. Yeah. So you might want to think about how you're going to reinforce it. You were talking about putting like a ramp on one end or something like that. Hold on a minute. Well, right now, I'm trying to make this ramp. I don't know if it's... Oh, yeah. Sick. So what kind of shape is that going to be? Is it going to be a curve, like a transition? Or is it going to be like a flat bank or a little pyramid? Or what's what are you thinking? Like a, like a normal ramp. Like the big one at Hackney Pumps. Because of this COVID stuff, that you can't really go out and skate. Once you see this, and this is going to disappear, and you'll see me doing it in real life. All right, so this is my skate dot, guys. Make sure to like, comment, share, subscribe. Shout out to Seeing Your Skate for giving this to me and Esther. So my name's Craig. I would definitely consider myself a model maker. When I saw the skate dot, I was like, man, I know I could probably flex my muscles a little bit and like try something else. A lot of the projects I work on um, follow a similar um kind of pattern um and and the skate dot definitely uh interrupted that and and made me um have to think about you know things a different way when the skate dots arrived i was just incredibly grateful for uh in, indoors activity and being able to i don't know use another part of my brain i maybe put aside for a bit um and get involved in sort of uh, creating something and designing something, uh, thinking about space, uh, what I like to skate, uh, what could be fun. So when I first received the kit, I mean, my first uh, reaction was like, it, it was incredibly generous. I was so stoked. I got, you know, you get a cutting mat, all these different materials to work with, um, different textures. Uh, I felt like it kind of really gave me the opportunity to like, to, I don't know, take so many different avenues to make something. This one's kind of like banks all round, but with like a, I don't know, a weird sort of double lip bump thing at the top. Um, last but not least, just wanted to have have a go using the the modelling clay. Uh, so I kind of went for building a little spine, but didn't want to make it just just a spine um, because I don't know. 
that's a bit too skate park like but also kind of again design this um in mind with the like non-skaters using it so maybe they use it as a bench something to lean on something to rest on i don't know So you've just heard from three people with very different experiences, a professional skateboarder, a professional model maker, and a secondary school child who doesn't have experience of model making to that extent. And it's this is what we're talking about when we're saying it's really important that we hear from people from lots of different um, kind of experiences. And to do that, we need to put in some support sometimes to make sure that we engage with the community that we're trying to. So we're very grateful to Nick from Hackney Bumps there, who did a video call with Delano to help to, to help him with his designs, because sometimes young people who don't have experience and sadly aren't having very much art teaching, perhaps in the rest of their lives, don't have the skills to do that. So we are trying to scaffold and support that experience so that we can get the design ideas from a bigger range as possible. Mm -hmm. And so in the kits that we sent out to people, um, the brief that we gave them was very open, um, but we did ask them to design a skate dot. Now, you're probably quite right by asking yourself, what is a skate dot? And as we said in our poster here, in our very first, project that we ever did um, in terms of um, putting something together, um, we made it quite clear that we don't know in as much as Esther and I don't know. Um, and that's kind of partly the point of the City Moorscape project is to allow a broad range of voices to feel included and to share their ideas with us in answering what this question is. Um, we have a few ideas of what a skate, a skate dot isn't. Um, so a skate dot is not a skate park. Um, um, skate parks often exclude certain features. They often exclude nature. They often exclude trees and plants and things like that. Um, and they offer, often exclude um, other groups. They often exclude non-skaters, members of the public. Um, and so, you know, often a skate park is a, uh, a sort of totalizing environment, um, which is very concrete heavy and it has a very clear line of demarcation between what is a uh, skate park and what isn't. Um, and then this poster that we created here, that you can see, um, we created some initial ideas um, with a fantastically talented architect friend um, about what a skate dot could be like, but they were certainly by no means definitives. Um, we were aware that, yeah, in creating things like skate parks, you create spaces which are designated to be skate park, and then outside of skate park is designated to be non-skate park, and there is a border between those two territories. We wanted to create something different, um, and so we created the concept of the skate dot to hang a series of ideas off and allow people to kind of respond to those ideas. Um, we wanted to create something different. A skate dot might be something more incidental, a punctuation which inhabits public space. Um, it can be used by skaters and non-skaters alike. Um, and in terms of its scale and its placement and possibly its configuration, it's perhaps something more similar to a piece of street furniture. So like a bench or a, a junction box or a, a flower planter or something like that. Um, and ideally actually, if it was to be seen in the wild by someone who didn't skate, they may not even necessarily understand it or perceive it to be a piece of skatable architecture. It could be something nice to sit on and have your lunch or to meet your friends with or to sit underneath and take some shade on a sunny day. Um, and so um, in the full length version of the film that we showed the trailer for earlier, um, we talk about um, some of the thinking behind these skate dots is also intended to recreate the idea of what it's like to go out street skateboarding in the wild. So actually to travel across a city um, with your friends um, and navigate these interesting routes th that you get um, in doing so, um, where you stop at um, things called skate spots, which are basically kind of small architectural features, which are fun to skateboard on. And you may skate there for a little while, and then there might be some, something fun and interesting across the street, which you would hop over to and skate for a bit. And then after you spent your time there, carry on and go somewhere else. And we were aware that there is precedent for these kinds of journeys and these kind of engagements with objects. So things like if you've ever been to a sculpture park 
or a nature trail and the way you would kind of navigate your way through that space and spend some time with these individual features. Um, it was something like that. And the, the idea of the skate dock was hit upon as a way of kind of trying to capture the spirit of that kind of journey that you move through space um, and you spend some time at kind of these particular punctuations within the space, but then you carry on. Um, so for us, skate dots as an idea are like skatable punctuations. They're like stepping stones kind of through a landscape, um, but crucially they're embedded in public space. So people who don't skate can use them too. Um, but then, you know, they are, they defy that idea of an enclosed environment um, of the skate park. Um, so that was our kind of idea of uh, the skate dots. And then that's on the basis that was formed the kind of backbone of the brief that we, we sent out to our recipients and asked them to um, share their ideas with us very much in the spirit of this idea of participatory design. Um, oops. Um, and so I can show you just some, a few more of the, the skate dot models. Um, Thanks, Sam. So of the 68 kits that we've sent out so far, we've had about two thirds of the recipients have returned models. Often people return two or three models from one kit, which is really quite exciting. You can see them all on our Instagram and in the gallery on our website, although there are a few that are still to be added. Just gonna show you a few now um, uh, that are on our Instagram. This one's from Piyumi. Laf Mudali and Puyumi has centered her skate dot design around permaculture gardens. So these ideas which explore innovation in materials and also in horticulture are really important to our vision because we have a vision of biodiverse environments for skatable architecture, which deviates from traditional skate park design. Um, Just move over. Click through. Thank yeah. you driving Sam and at some point you can go full screen if you can but this one is um, Ian Borden's we're delighted that Ian Borden thank you Ian created a skate dot model um, and that Ian explores design with adaptive skateboarding in mind. Um, Ian's created a street inspired spot with enhancements to make it better for visually impaired skaters and we've sent a series of skate dot making kits to riders in the wheelchair motocross community WCMX. And we're excited to see what designs come up with, um, come, come back to us, because designing in ways that WCMX riders, um, that work for WCMX riders is really important to us. Things like, for example, being able to push back up to the top to ride something again, but being able to do that independently without necessarily needing a helper to be there. Things like that are important considerations for us and we want to explore those in the dot making. Um, and if I can go back to... Go to Kelly Watson and Sarah Prinsloos, um, who created a beginner friendly skate dot to allow newer skaters to practice in peace and away from hordes of passers-by. Um, this fantastic creation is going to appear at Somerset House in the upcoming skateboarding exhibition. So you can see it in real life there. Um, one other one that I just wanted to draw attention to was made by Danny. Danny is, um, I think, eight years old and represents the next generation of skateboarders. He got involved in skateboarding via community skate lessons at Hackney Bumps. And I think this is really interesting, this idea of how you create a community. So having gotten involved that way, he created designs based on bike storage on his street. He had a Zoom call with Daryl from Beton Park, who are our project design partners, and Daryl helped to finesse the ideas. So this idea of supporting people new to skateboarding and growing our community is, is really important to our work. But it's not the only voice that we want to hear. So the last example that I just want to show you is um, from Tommy Harrison who um, I think it's further up, Sam, um, who has drawn from skate history in the things that he made, the things that he has made. Um, he's also used a lot of planting. So Tommy 
thought about iconic skate street architecture. These are the Victoria benches, which were a favorite piece of street architecture for skateboarders and which sadly no longer exist. Um, so we love this idea of drawing from history and particularly here, this giant soap shaped block pays homage to the history of the local area um, around the Olympic Park by referencing the old Yardley soap factory that used to be at Hackney Wick. Um, so do, do go along and look at more of them. The, the wealth of ideas is incredible. And in a minute, we'll tell you about what we're going to do with those ideas and how we're going to generate them into real life. So. Um, just as a, a, a nerdy aside, I bored everyone to tears with this story. If you go to Hackney Wick on the site of the old Yardley soap factory on a rainy day, there is so much um, soap in the, in the topsoil that it still smells of lavender on a rainy day. Um, but uh, that's my nerdy local history aside out of the way. Um, so public space and where, where will City Millscape hopefully exist? Um, so our project is to explore spaces in and around the new UCL East campus in, on the Olympic Park. Um, it's a place with a very new identity um, and a place whose um, image, it's public image and it's kind of geographical re resonances are constantly evolving. Um, you know, not for nothing right now do we have an entirely new campus being built at two locations on, you know, on the UCL site, as well as lots of other institutions who are um, going to be establishing outposts there as well. Um, so interestingly, uh, this area has kind of, because it's, its identity is changing, it's almost partly rendered the area invisible to some local residents. As, as Esther and I recently discovered, we partnered with um, a local organization called Change Grow Live um, to offer skateboard lessons for children based in Newham. And we actually had quite a few attendees who barely even visited the Olympic Park or the Here East site where the lessons had taken place. And I, and that's, I found that quite interesting because certainly um, in terms of skateboarding, this area doesn't have a, any kind of mythologies attached to it. And that's particularly interesting in a place like London where London, cities often have very dense and very hyper-local mythologies that center around architectural features or skate spots as they're known. Um, and these skate spots and then the names that are attached to them become emblematic for whole canons of audiovisual and oral history that, sur that surround um, who's performed which tricks on which bit of the architectural feature and when it was done and who did it first. Um, and often the names of these skate spots are also extremely perfunctory. They are designed to literally signpost geographically where this place is. So what might be known as the Hayward Gallery Undercroft to quite a lot of other people, to skaters, is South Bank, because it's on the South Bank. As Esther mentioned a minute ago, when we showed um, Thomas Harrison's skate dots, the Victoria benches were in Victoria, and lo and behold, they were a set of benches. But the, the, the naming conventions are also very perfunctory, in the same way that skateboard tricks are as well. And they often describe exactly kind of what's happening in, in very kind of basic terms. And so this idea to inhabit this kind of naming convention is what um, informed our um, decision to call the project City Mill Skate because we've named ourselves after the river which runs through um, quite a large part of the Olympic Park and runs adjacent to um, two of the UCL sites too. So we did so um, with this history of kind of um, naming places after names um, to establish this idea of, of placemaking um, and aware of the fact that the Queen Elizabeth of Park's former history as an industrial center has been partly erased to kind of make way for the Olympic development. And so um, we had a kind of a fairly blank slate and so needed to kind of think of a name which would establish our exact actual, our actual geographic site as part of a process of placemaking and, and, and building on um, uh, an association of skateboarding um, as an activity um, taking place in a territory whose identity hasn't fully coalesced yet. Um, outside of the immediate vicinity of UCL and the Olympic Park, um, we're also keenly aware of the need to kind of posit our project in the context of other community-led initiatives that are taking place uh, to, and that are seeking to create skatable architecture around East London. As Esther mentioned, and as Esther is sporting a lovely T-shirt um, today, we have the Hackney Bumps project, which is taking place uh, just on the other side of um, the River Ling, 
um, in Homerton. Um, there's also a, a project to create um, a DIY skate park, it's roughly similar to what you see behind me. This sadly no longer exists, but it's a good working example. And there's a project taking place um, on a piece of land um, administered by TFL, uh, which is next to the nearby Mably Green Park, and it, that, where a bunch of um, BMXs have, um, are working with TFL to adapt a space to create DIY skatable architecture um, in an area underneath the A12. And so City Mill Skates project is not just about placing, um, empowering kind of users of all, of all types to share their ideas with us and feel um, like their opinions are valued, but it's also very much about understanding the, the locality in immediate terms around the UCL estate, but also within kind of the wider context of East London. And so a big part of the City Millscape project is about maintaining dialogue with these other initiatives, such as the Hackney Bumps project and the Mably Green project um, to ensure that our respective outcomes complement each other and that we kind of, we kind of can build a, a kind of more a richer fabric of, of skatable, spaces, skatable spaces across East London, where, I mean, in a longer tale of kind of London, London East London history in particular, um, skatable spaces were kind of thin on the ground. They were more commonly associated with uh, central London, north London, east and west, and actually south too. East was was a bit a bit more kind of barren in those terms. So you know, we're very aware of, of the need to kind of um, be in, in dialogue with these other um, organisations. Um, and so with that in mind. Thank you, Sam. I'm quite conscious of time and we want to make sure that there's time for questions and discussion so mm. but we've got a, a couple more slides to go through um so the use of public space is contentious um and raises questions about who owns it who has a right to be there and what they want to use it for now women have often cited quite a different relationship with public space than men in terms of issues of ownership, legitimacy, access, and crucially, safety. Skateboarders are familiar with restrictions about what they can and can't skate and how they can use the street or public spaces or privately owned spaces which appear to be public. Um, and skateboarding has in the past been seen as an antisocial activity, uh, treated as criminal in some parts of the world. But there's some wonderful examples. Ian showed a few at the beginning and, and some fa fabulous European cities would add to like Bordeaux in France and Malmo in Sweden or Copenhagen in Denmark um, amongst many others have turned around that idea and now integrate skate friendly architecture into their own urban planning from, a, from an early stage. And this is fantastic, it has, leads to fantastically differently used public space. Over the past couple of years, there's been a huge increase in the number of people skateboarding, partly because of the restrictions imposed during lockdowns and a need to stay local. But also I think the impact and legitimacy that's afforded by skateboarding's inclusion for the first time in the Olympics in Tokyo later this year, if it goes ahead. Through this combination of factors, the idea of skateboarding is now, I think, is shifting to being seen as something more positive, something healthy, something community enhancing, something social and critically, I think all these things are, are great. I'm glad to see them as developments. In terms of my personal academic research, skateboarding is something that boys and girls both want to participate in an activity that is engaging girls in interactive, non-competitive, social, yet physical ways. And this is crucial to the way that we design urban spaces and has been long overlooked. The design of the city needs to reflect uh, the need for safe spaces to be physical, to hang out, and somewhere in the words of the Make Space for Girls project that balances arts, sport and free play, um, which I think is a fantastic uh, tr trio of things which we would also endorse with the work we're doing with City Mill Skate. I'll go to the next slide, Sam, and just to then map onto that what's coming out of our research. 
So because of all those reasons are four stated, it's, we think it's critical that our skate dot design, our, that the designs of skate docks represent the multiple voices and perspectives of the skate community. This is a dot designed by Emily Badescu, and it's made in a beautifully rudimentary way out of a toilet roll and a cardboard block. It's both skatable and social. And um, I don't think we've got time to go to her Instagram, um, but you can do that later. In the selection of, it, um, oh, here it is. The selection of images that Emily sent so that we could put a post together, she includes um, a campfire, this little candle, but this idea that the space is thought about, not just the riding, but the space in which you might hang out um, and that a campfire is thought about for a kind of end of session chilling. So this seems to reflect some of those things that I was talking about in terms of urban design. To prepare for the next stage in the development of City Mills Gate, our delivery partners, Betong Park, have drawn this full scale version of the dot so that we may so that we can see how it might be placed in a landscape in real life as a precursor to those things being built um, to test back to you Sam. Mm -hmm. um, and so where are we up to now as of today um, so we are exploring uh, several potential uh, sites to, to construct and test our skate docks on, um, close to the new UCL campus, as well as within the vicinity of the Queen Elizabeth Olympic Park. Um, the, and this was always in the spirit of what we wanted to do, but you know, the idea of, a, any, because a dot is more of a kind of modular feature versus a proposal for a kind of an entire environment. We're in a, in a process of having um, lots of different discussions, exploring the possibilities of, of making, selecting dots that will dovetail nicely with potential sites um, and kind of complement what's already kind of taking place there. Um, I think the, the advantage that we have at the moment is that we've had such a fantastic wealth and you know, breadth of, of ideas that have been submitted. We've kind of got lots and lots of possibilities to explore when looking at kind of how to slot skate dots into these potential sites. Um, and then from that point onwards, um, you know, hopefully we can move, we're hoping to move to kind of a build stage where we can actually then, once they're constructed, um, they, the dots themselves can be subjected to practical assessment, which is very much kind of part of our project as well. That are, you know, in the spirit of the kind of trial and error side of skateboarding, that these dots would be constructed and the ideas that were um, brought out through the model making, you know, in terms of converting an idea into a basic model can then be tested practically with a skateboard. And that allows, allows an extra layer of learning and iteration in terms of how we would um, move forward and perhaps iterate on these kind of dots to improve them or change them. Um, we're also talking to uh, the LLDC, um, who are the governing body of the Olympic Park about potential sites across the park and, um, you know, exploring, starting to explore the possibility of um, moving outward potentially from the UCL campus to inhabit kind of other areas across the park and potentially create a larger network of skate dots that would lead you know skaters and members of the public too in kind of interesting um, routes across the park where they could kind of take in these features um, as they go. Fabulous. Um, We've got some great questions that I can see appearing um, on Slido. Okay. Um, I was just going to finish with our last slide just to say um, if you would like to find out more about our project, please do visit our website. Um, we've got um, lots of information about us, about our original, you know, the, the research we've conducted so far, uh, updates about things that we've been up to recently. Uh, we'll be offering more skate lessons in the summer. Um, we have a lovely gallery of all the dots that um, have been submitted. submitted. Um, there are more information about our research, who we are as well, what our backgrounds are. Um, and then the means to get in touch with us too. And there's a link there for our Instagram channel as well, if you would like to contact us through that route as well. Um, so that's that. Thanks. Thanks very much. We are... Oh, well, thank you very much, Ian, Esther and Sam. It was really fabulous. Uh, 
we have got a few questions on Slido, so I will read them out uh, and then uh, um, you decide who would like um, uh, to pick which, which question. So the first one is, uh, can you tell us more about the skateboarding as an academic discipline? Is it about design, sustainability, urban living? What would I learn as a student? Who would like to pick that question? I'll take, shall I take that one? Yeah. Yes, please. Um, there are many people across the world now. When I started writing about skateboarding, there were only about two of us, two academics in the world dealing with it, myself and a woman called Becky Beale. There are now, I guess, hundreds of people doing it. But there's no academic discipline about skateboarding. So what you find is that people come at it from different angles. I come at it as an architectural historian and a historian of public space. Sam wrote his dissertation on it when you were a student at UCL, didn't you, Sam? And you came at it looking at videos, yes. skateboarding videos. Um, uh, Esther is engaged very much on the sociology and the kind of users of, of, of skateboarding. And often some, you know, some people are very interested in the gender profile. What I would say is whatever subject you do at university, you can connect to skateboarding with it. And I've seen everything from mathematics and physics to technology of materials, to art, to photography, to design and so on. Skateboarding is a very rich endeavor. So you can connect with it in lots of different ways. That's a wonderful answer. Thank you, Ian. So the second question, it's about electric skateboarding and the impact that technology has on the community, culture and making space of these skaters. I can uh, jump in on this one, I think. So I think there's been a very interesting moment over the last year in terms of sort of governmental attitudes towards, I suppose, what you would call micro mobility solutions. Um, there has been a sea change in government around attitudes to things like electric scooters and things like that. Um, in, you know, I suppose, you know, necessity being the mother of invention, or certainly in this case, legislation, um, and allowing people access to technologies which allowed for independent micro mobility in a time where a lot of people simply didn't want to take public transport because it wasn't particularly safe to do so. And so I, I kind of, you know, the, the technologies are adjacent to each other in terms of like electric scooter technology and electric skateboards. And so I think it's, it's a very interesting and sort of useful moment in terms of these things coming to the fore about there being alternatives to um, the automobile, to kind of public transport, for people who need to make kind of short journeys quickly and easily. Um, so I think it's, you know, it's definitely kind of raised the profile um, of these devices, which have always allowed it. Um, I think one of the interesting ironies, I suppose, is that skateboarding has always allowed those kind of, that, that allow that type of micro mobility. It's just, you might be powered by sandwiches instead of a battery. Um, but, um, you know, I think it's, it's a net positive for us in terms of actually, you know, uh, it's precipitated a very useful conversation about the, 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 the usefulness, not only in practical terms, but actually in terms of like mental health and kind of well-being from a, you know, from a, a non-powered skate, you know, point of view of actually getting out and doing exercise. You know, I see it as being kind of part of that, you know, as the past year has definitely taught us, has shown a lot of people just how important and valuable public space is, for example, um, the parks and things like that. And the ability to kind of access those in, in new ways is, you know, and, and, a, and a useful discussion around that can be no bad thing. Mm. Thank you, Sam. The next question is from uh, somebody living near Crystal Palace Skate Park. And he's asking, saying a lot of kids with scooters use it as do roller skaters. Did you reach out to any of those users? Yeah, I, I can speak to that one. Um, um, and yes, we did reach out to BMX riders um, as well as the adaptive skate boarders that I mentioned earlier who use um, sport like wheelchairs, but we've also reached out to roller skaters, um, again, for all the reasons already mentioned of wanting to hear from people about what they would like to skate. I think attached to that um, is the idea of building a community, building a culture around skateboarding and other wheeled users. We would broadly say all wheels are welcome. Um, but where space is contentious, and at the moment with things being so busy, we are finding ourselves in a situation where 
people have to share and people have to learn sharing within the environment. And there are some rather nice ways in which that positively happens within um, skate parks and other spaces which are frequented by lots of people in terms of a kind of etiquette that develops and is passed on through people. So that's where this idea of creating community is really vital, that by creating a community, you start to create a way of approaching, a way of being that is acceptable in those places. And that sort of hopefully continues to make it an inclusive activity. If I can just come in. Yes, on, please, if I can just come in on that as well, just because I use the Crystal Palace skate park quite a lot. Um, it's my local skate park. You'll see me there most weekends. It, it is really interesting there how some of the kids there, sometimes you think about people who are either roller skaters or roller booters or skateboarders. It's really interesting to see some of the kids and they move between the, the uh, certainly between scooters and skateboards. Um, and um, uh, some people might uh, either in a single session or over a while they, you know, forego the scooter and pick up a skateboard or maybe they give up the skateboard and pick up the BMX um, device as well. And I think it relates to the electric skateboard question as well, that in a way what we're talking about, as, as Esther says, is, is all wheeled users. It's a different kind of approach to using the landscape where we're not just thinking of people as either walking or cycling, and we're not just thinking about people either consuming or going to work. It's a much kind of richer and more nuanced sense of all the different ways that people might inhabit the landscape. So in that sense, all these different kinds of technologies are, are really interesting um, about how they've raised questions about how people don't just access public space, but also how they become urban citizens. I think it's really interesting listening to Esther and Sam talk about how, in a way, the process of building and designing the skate dots it, it, it was almost as if that's as important as the things themselves and the riding, because it's the process of doing it. And through that, you get meaningful communities rather than just spaces where different people happen to sort of be but not know each other. Um, so this is part of a process of creating what we hope is a much richer and dynamic kind of public space. Thank you. The next question is, I live in Greece, wonderful, and hoping for a skate park here. Would love to integrate your methodology. How do you persuade skeptical old councils and funders this works, to do this work? How do you do that? You start with something. <laughs> Way, it doesn't matter what you start with you start with a petition or you start with us with a with a with a few ramps and you do a demonstration or you do something and what you have to do is build build agreement through as many different so i hate the word but stakeholders as possible and that means not just the it's so it's not i think it's not just skateboarders saying we want a skate park build it for us it's about showing that that um as many different groups as possible buy into this. And this means both the, the non-riders as well as the riders. When we built um, Crystal Palace Skate Park, a lot of the support came from people who were not skateboarders, but who wanted to see something that was positive for riders, I was about to say youth, but riders of all ages across the, across the borough. So I think that the thing to do is just start with something small and then build from there. Mm -hmm. Esther mentioned Malmö in Sweden, so, uh, southern Sweden, which is in a way the, the world capital of skateboarding these days. But they, they've spent 10, 15, 20 years gradually building up relationships with the, um, with, uh, with the, the local council and other authorities. But they started off just by building, you know, a little skate dock, having a small skate park and so on. So just do something and work from there. And I think just extremely quickly to build on Ian's point, because we've been asked in the past, people have said to us, oh, we love your methodology. We think it's fantastic. We want to use it as a model for best practice. And Esther and I say, no, 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 no. There's, there's no definitive way to do this. 
the if there is a rule about the best way to do it is to actually understand your local context and make sure that your project is completely cognizant of those considerations and you tailor your approach to fit those so if they could if there had to be a definitive model for best practice it would be that that there isn't a one size fits all approach you must understand the you know the context in which you're operating in and that actually if you do have if you are finding yourself in a situation where you are butting up against skeptical stakeholders the more you can demonstrate that you've actually understood the context at all its levels that will stand you in good stead and you do that by listening and entering entering into meaningful dialogue with the people who are going to use that space um, rather than thinking you know what's best for other people uh, there's also a really useful book that ian ought to plug at this point which has been very valuable in the hackney bumps regeneration project um, which is a useful guide of how to approach local councils which i can't remember the title in yeah if you go for, if you search for skateboarding gb online and then go to that they have a um a guide to skate parks and skateboarding um i was one of the authors of it and it's a sort of 50 60 page pdf that you can download that gives really good advice on all the benefits and examples of skateboarding and skate parks and skatable spaces wonderful it's 201 and uh, unfortunately we have uh, come to the end of this uh, fantastic uh, lunch hour lecture thank you uh, very much esther sam and ian for such a great presentation and discussion and thank you everyone for being with us today if you want to learn more or listen to more uh, lectures or listen to ucl pod podcasts please visit the ucl minds webpage goodbye and stay well thank you thanks Paula. bye